Okay. Maybe other people could go on mute. Yeah, Thank, thanks for that, Sandra. Yes, um, in, in, in terms of procedure, we'd appreciate if you're not speaking, if you could just put your microphone on mute so that we avoid any uh, feedback loops uh, during the conversation. Uh, as I said before we went live, just that everybody knows we are recording this meeting and uh, your contributions will be attributed uh, to your digital history. So um, to everyone, a very, very good morning, good afternoon and good evening. I'd like to first off just acknowledge your generous gift of time. Uh, we all have busy schedules and we really appreciate the effort uh, you are taking to join us and help shape uh, OERU futures. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the members of the OER Foundation Board who are with us here. Uh, Sandra Wills, I know Mary Burgess is joining us if she hasn't already, uh, Jim Taylor and uh, David Porter. Also our senior leaders from um, Canada, uh, New Zealand and elsewhere. But most of all, I'd like to welcome our observers from uh, institutions who are not yet members of the OER Foundation. Uh, we are a radically open and transparent organization. Everything we do, we conduct openly. Uh, we, in fact, have recordings of all our meetings and minutes in the wiki uh, since inception. Uh, so we are very grateful for your participation. Uh, of course, we would like observers a whole lot more should the institutions decide to join our International Innovation Partnership. But I just wanted to say that you're most welcome uh, in joining us. Um, in terms of time, I also acknowledge the folk on the east coast of Australia who have a much earlier start than usual, and also our colleagues on the east coast of uh, the US who we are, you know, are sacrificing a bit of family time to be with us. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and say you know, thank you very much for your time. Uh, with your permission, we have quite a, uh, a large number of folk who are attending. I would like to uh, move directly into the agenda and not go through a round of personal introductions uh, because that would you know, take up about half an hour of our time. But uh, there will be ample opportunity for anybody to contribute at any time. So with your permission, I'd like to move forward uh, with the agenda. So in terms of the purpose of the meeting, uh, a couple of main objectives here. Uh, we want to just uh, take a look and review our progress with the launch of the OVRU first year of study, uh, update you on a number of technology improvements we have on the platform. Uh, it's that time of the process where we will, are consulting on the strategic plan for 2018 through to 2021, which will be tabled at the international partners meeting. So we're taking feedback on the early drafts now. And uh, Possibly the most important item on the agenda is the discussion and input into the agenda for the partners meeting. Our open approaches are such that we consult with our uh, members around the world on, the, on what you would like to be discussing at the partners meeting. So just in uh, sort of a high level overview of what we're going to be looking at. I also want to share some outstanding news um, with support from Otago Polytechnic um, uh, who have contributed a full-time equivalent to assist with the assembly of OERU courses as an additional contribution. Uh, this is a role that will be shared by uh, Simone Wood and Claire Good at the Polytechnic. Uh, there was a short news announcement uh, about that on the website. So we're very excited to get additional capacity on board in moving us forward. And I do want to acknowledge the contribution from Otago Polytechnic. Um, we've done the acknowledgement of participants, so we can move forward to item two here on the agenda. And I should possibly do a screen share that would make things a lot easier. There we go. That should be coming through for you now. So we're moving here on to item two of the agenda. Uh, just to take a quick uh, look at our delivery platform, particularly for uh, colleagues who haven't seen the OERU delivery platform, which is you know, quite unique in fact. Um, our whole view and, uh, on the delivery of uh, you know, OER is to 
think carefully about what the delivery of open education will look like in a decentralized web of the future, uh, what some people are calling Web 3.0. And what we have done is we have, in fact, assembled a component-based system which uh, emphasizes learning on the internet rather than learning via a single application like a learning management system. We publish all our course materials on a course site, uh, which looks uh, something like this. Uh, we use uh, WordPress as the open source technology for hosting the published versions of our course materials. Uh, this is the homepage of the first micro course for learning in a digital age. You'll see here that the courses are assembled from a number of learning pathways, which learners can then navigate through. I have a bit of latency lag here. Uh, pages aren't loading quickly, but we'll just need to be patient. Um, learners will navigate through the individual pages uh, of the learning pathways where the activities and uh, interactions are embedded. So let's just give you a high level overview of what our uh, platform looks like. Uh, the, where it starts getting interesting is the component based uh, delivery system we use for all learner interactions. Uh, we have assembled a platform from best of read open source software for different interaction features within the platform. So for example, we use uh, or we host our own social media platform, uh, an open source alternative to Twitter called Mastodon. Uh, learners publish their artifacts of learning on their own personal blog so that they retain control of their own data and information. And long after the courses are finished, we have an internal commenting engine called Wiki Educator Notes. We also make use of Hypothesis, which is an open source technology that enables learners to annotate any web page on the web, including PDF documents that are uploaded on the web. Uh, we have um, a piece of technology uh, which we use for social bookmarking or our OERU course repository, which where uh, learners are encouraged to source open access materials in support of their learning and to share the, uh, what they find with the, the, the rest of the cohorts. And of course, we use the discourse platform for our um, discussion forums. Moving back to the course site here, we use syndication technology to aggregate all the interactions across these distributed technologies. And so you'll see here on the course site, for example, a number of interactions that come from different technologies. Uh, this is an example of a blog post I just posted last night, which has been harvested for the course feed. Here's an example of a, co a comment a learner posted on the course site. Uh, here's a contribution from the course forum. Uh, here are examples of hypothesis annotations. Uh, I'm not sure if you are familiar with hypothesis. We can go to the source here. Let's see if we get it to load quickly enough. Um, so, you know, this is an article where we invited learners uh, to explore the differences between digital skills and digital literacies. Uh, this is an article published by Maha Bailey, uh, based at the uh, International University of Cairo. I'm just waiting for it to load here. If it doesn't load quick enough, there we go. Let's switch off these annotations. So basically how this works is, um, you know, this is a page on the internet. Uh, a learner can, you know, highlight any uh, part, any, uh, aspect of the article, click the annotate button, and you'll see if I'm logged in here, which I am, uh, I'm just moving things around here on my desktop a bit, uh, learners can uh, post comments in the comment box, and as long as they include the course tag or the course code, our systems will be able to harvest um, those feeds for the course annotation. So it's a, a, a very rich environment, and in fact, a working uh, model of a distributed next generation digital learning environment. Uh, what's more is our technologies are based entirely on open source infrastructure. We publish the technical recipes for uh, setting up these technologies, which means that any partner institution, in fact, any institution in the world would be able to replicate um, these environments. 
So this is a high level overview of what the learning platform looks like. Uh, at the OERU, we are aiming to implement what we are calling a perpetual academic year. And so for each micro course that we have, there will be four offerings each year. Three cohort based offerings with fixed start dates and finish dates, as well as an independent study option. Now, um, we are moving forward with the implementation of effectively two full first years of study. Um, and that's a uh, full first year of study equates to 30 micro courses. And you can do the mental math. Um, that would, once we're fully operational, uh, effectively mean 240 offerings uh, of these micro courses each year. And so for an organization like the OER Foundation, which only has two full-time staff members, we need to think very carefully about how we can scale uh, these operations. And one of the ways we do that is by making use of marketing automation software on the back end to automate the email instructions that go out for our courses for the individual cohorts as well as the independent study options. Um, I can show you an example of a Mortic campaign over here. So this is uh, looking at the Mortic software engine. This is the campaign that is used for uh, one of the cohorts of learning in the digital age, the first micro course, Leader 101. And you'll see what is happening here when the learner uh, signs up for the course, they're assigned a number of tags which enable us to manage the interactions on the back end. They will immediately receive the orientation email um, which then invites them to complete the preference survey um, to, uh, to express what their preferences are regarding study. And based on the preferences that they express, we then assign them to the corresponding campaigns in our MORTIC. So the emails that learners are receiving are automated. And so in this example, it was the first cohort on the 14th of March, learners would receive the instructions for session one on the 19th of March, session two, on the 22nd of March, session three, and so forth and so forth. Uh, one of the advantages of these systems is we know more or less when learners will be thinking about assessment. And at that point, we will be able to inject the marketing collateral of the partners who are offering assessment services for those courses. So that's just a you know, high level overview of what a MORTIC campaign looks like. Now, one of the advantages of using marketing automation software for these instructions is that we can integrate our marketing efforts with the pedagogical elements of our course delivery. And so we've been doing a little bit of work consistent with the decisions of the 2017 partners meeting. We have been improving uh, the landing pages for our high level courses. And uh, I can show you an example here. This is the uh, course landing page for introduction to project management. Uh, this is the high level course. It consists of four micro courses. Uh, and from this page, learners can opt in for, um, you know, to uh, sign up if they want to. Uh, if they did, uh, opt in to sign up, what happens here is they are taken to a landing page that is administered by MORTIC, is a high level course description, what the benefits of this course are. If they sign up here, they would then be associated with the corresponding campaigns for that course. Um, this also helps us with marketing when we start implementing pay per click marketing strategies. Uh, learners will be directed to the respective landing pages depending on uh, their interests. Uh, true to the philosophies of the OERU, learning materials should not be locked behind password access. If a learner wanted to start studying in, uh, immediately uh, without uh, registering or giving, giving away a password, they can get immediate access to our course resources. So that's a very high level overview of what the platform looks like and how we are integrating um, marketing automation uh, technologies uh, in supporting the work that we're doing. So what I might do at this point is just break uh, for any questions, uh, thoughts or comments from the floor.
Wayne, I see that uh, David Porter has um, put a question in the chat about whether what happens after interest is registered. I, I'm not sure if uh, David, you're still, I think Wayne mentioned what happens there that it, it Okay, part of the challenge I've got with my desktop layout, I'm not seeing the chat. So, uh, Dave, th thanks for the question. You must know if there's an onboarding process. Yes, there is. We have set up a orientation email campaign uh, for our learners. Um, in fact, I think I do have a flowchart example here of a onboarding process campaign. So this is a high level flow chart. I'm not going to go into the detail, but if a learner says, hey, I'm interested in this course, they will get an email saying, welcome to this course. Uh, we see that you're a first time OERU learner. Are you interested in receiving our orientation emails? And then based on the decisions that uh, they take and the information they provide us, we will then assign them to the respective campaigns. That is whether they uh, are intending to study uh, as a cohort, or do they want to study as independent study? Uh, are they opting in for course announcements? Do you want to receive the orientation emails? And if they opt in for the orientation emails, they will res then receive a series of emails which help them get started with study with the OERU. I mean, the system is also smart enough to know that if somebody has completed the orientation campaign, uh, they wouldn't be presented with the campaign again unless they opted in. So, um, David, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. I think it's a very gentle marketing campaign, Wayne. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about LinkedIn and uh, LinkedIn learning in our jurisdiction, and it's a lot more aggressive than this. So um, I think uh, finding the right balance will be an important uh, thing to evaluate over the next few months. Absolutely, David. I'm in total agreement. Uh, a little later in this meeting, I'll speak to some interesting and exciting developments on the marketing front, and we can pick up the conversation there. Any other questions? Uh, Dave, I'm not seeing the chat here. So. Sa San Sandra has asked uh, whether universities get stats on how many are using their, their modules if, they, if, if a learner clicks start learning. Absolutely. Once, uh, and that's one of the benefits of partnership. Uh, member institutions will have access to the data that we have on all aspects of our marketing campaigns, as well as the statistics of the individual course sites. So yes, uh, our partner institutions will have access to that data. I mean, I think it is a, a significant advantage of membership uh, in the network. If there are no other questions in uh, our OERU traditions, we take silence to mean assent, um, and then I can move on with the agenda. Okay. Moving on, uh, a, a little bit of a report back on the launch of the OERU first year of study. Uh, at the meeting of the OERU Council of Chief Executive Officers, we agreed that we would launched the first course uh, in February, uh, followed by the remaining courses. Um, and um, a, a good decision, but I'm not sure we thought through all the dependencies uh, before going live. Um, and um, I think the greatest lesson we've learned with the launch of the OERU first year of study is that the devil is in the detail. Um, so there were a couple of things that we needed to get done before launching the first course one of which was uh, getting the learner support site sorted. We realized, well, we actually didn't have any uh, substantive resources providing support for learners onboarding into uh, the OERU courses. So we spent um, January and February building the learner support site, which um, provides support to learners and also minimizes the number of questions which Dave and I have to answer for new learners coming on board. So we have a full set of resources available, which um, help learners get started, explains how study with the OERU works. Um, we've got detailed information with corresponding uh, video recordings of how to get started with the different technologies. 
and instructions on you know where to post questions and additional help resources. We've also structured you know an FAQ section, so we have a full um, you know learner support site available for all our learners before they embark on their study with us. Um, one of the interesting uh, challenges we faced early with the launch of the first year of study is you, you would have seen that we make extensive use of MORTIC, the open source uh, um, marketing automation software on the back end. And previously we were utilizing the hosted service of MORTIC run by uh, MORTIC.com. And when they started out, it was, it, it was quite affordable at 30 US dollars a month for the levels of traffic that uh, we were anticipating. Um, and early this year, Mortic uh, changed their pricing models, uh, the hosted service. Um, just to give you a little bit of an idea, um, anybody can set up their own Mortic account using the Mortic open source software. There's a free account available. Um, of course, with uh, you know these premium models, there are always a number of restrictions. There's only one user uh, that will have admin rights to the um, to the site. 5,000 contact limit, um, but here's where the challenge starts coming in. They rate restrict the number of emails that go out. So any uh, marketing or you know course announcement emails that go would be restricted to 100 a day. Um, and then they have a tiered model based on how many uh, contacts are registered in the system. Um, you know we're looking at prices you know around about $500 a month, but we go you know. Uh, get sig uh, significantly higher than that based on the number of contacts. So within the OERU model, we had conversations with Mortic.com. Ideally, we would have liked a, a model whereby we are, uh, the charges are based on the active contacts. In other words, you know, when a course is running, they would be an active contact. And you know, you know, that's where the traffic lies in terms of the emails that are going out. However, their pricing model, and fair enough, it's, you know, it's a business startup, is based entirely on the number of contacts. So we took the bold decision in moving forward in hosting our own Mortic. And in hindsight, it's been a good decision because you'll see uh, we already have uh, just short of 13,000 contacts within our Mortic. And uh, to date, we have sent out about 20,000 emails through the system. So at the you know sort of corporate pricing levels, their their pricing structure is not well suited to the OERU model. But fortunately, we uh, it is it is an open source system, and so we've taken on hosting uh, the Mortic software engine ourselves. But that you know was a bit of extra time in getting these things set up. The learning curve in uh, getting these campaigns up and running is steep but it is uh, incredibly valuable knowledge in being able to improve our marketing as we move forward. Uh, we were also uh, welcomed with the uh, enforcement of the European General Data Protection Regulation, which became enforceable on the 25th of May. And while as a nonprofit entity, we are not legally bound uh, to be GDPR compliant, uh, our, as an open organization, we believe strongly in data protection and you know, privacy of our learners. So uh, we went ahead and uh, moved forward with revising our privacy policies, as well as setting up a, you know, the privacy notice and our you know, software to be GDPR compliant. So just going to get many of you would have experienced all the emails going out in may you know please opt in here and opt in there uh, that was all related to gdpr compliance but basically how this works is we provide detailed information on uh, all the information we hold this information we hold and in the case of the OVR, OVRU, it's not much but we also provide uh, you know detail on how we use that information uh, so I'm not going to go into all the, the detail, but we are now GDPR compliant. So, um, I mean, this is important for our European partners. But again, that was another uh, four weeks, a month's worth of time in getting that up and running. 
And then we were finally in a position to be able to launch Learning in the Digital Age in March. Um, I can, you know, the high level data is there. We had uh, 703 participants uh, who registered, uh, 659 who participated without registration, uh, which we pick up from our website uh, statistics. Uh, we intentionally didn't advertise widely um, because uh, being you know, the first launch with all these technologies, we wanted to make sure that everything was working as we anticipated. Uh, but uh, we managed to attract learners from 60 different countries. Uh, the top countries there uh, uh, showing there are listed, the top 13 countries, India, United States, Canada, Fiji, Nigeria, New Zealand, PNG, South Africa, Uganda, Australia, Egypt, and Kenya. Um, the other data is there. Uh, what I thought I would also show you is uh, the data we have on the new participant survey. We pr uh, provide an, an optional new participant survey for learners. Roughly about 10% of the learners complete uh, the survey. Uh, but I thought this would be in, uh, useful information. Uh, you can see we are uh, largely mature adults, the majority uh, older than uh, 25 years. Uh, with the largest segment being, you know, 46 to 52 years of age. Um, the split between, uh, we have roughly about 44% English second language learners uh, based on the data we've collected so far. Um, the split, 60% uh, female, 35% uh, male. Uh, pretty global. Uh, I'm quite happy to see a reasonable percentage coming from sub-Saharan Africa so far, uh, which is interesting. Majority of uh, participants are in full-time employment, 52%, whereas the remainder are in various uh, forms of part-time employment. Um, roughly about 60% have actually participated in an online course before. Um, Primary motivations for study, uh, by far, uh, professional development. So, I mean, that's going to be an important market moving forward for OERU. Uh, this one is particularly interesting. Uh, particularly interesting uh, question we asked uh, the question around micro credentials uh, because the majority of our courses will have micro credentials that are mapped to formal academic credit. Uh, and you can see here 32% saying yes, um, they are interested in the credentials. But this is the interesting one. 34% uh, possibly interested uh, in you know, receiving credentials. So supporting this group, uh, I think, would need to be a priority uh, moving forward. So let me stop there for the moment. Um, that's in terms of the data of the first course that's launched. We are currently in the middle of the second course, Introduction to Project Management, which is currently running at the moment. Uh, based on the data we have so far, it's um, total number of learners, uh, just short of 960 uh, so far for OERU. Uh, and you can see the clusters that are emerging here. So obviously, when we start launching our marketing, we want we we'll, we aim to target the countries with the higher level enrollments. So the clusters around Vanuatu, US, of course, UK, Uganda, um, South Africa is quite big. Uh, Papua New Guinea, Nigeria, New Zealand, of course, uh, Kenya, India is by far the largest segment. Um, Clusters emerging, Fiji, uh, Canada, of course. Bangladesh is proving to be a, a, a growing area for us, obviously Australia. So it just give you a bit of idea of where the clusters of learners are coming from based on you know, early data. But I, I need to emphasize, I mean, uh, this is early data. Uh, as we move forward, we'll be collecting richer data to be able to base our decisions in the future. So let me just leave it there and open up the floor for any questions, comments, or insights. Uh, Wayne, 
uh, Sandra has uh, asked a few, I don't know if you noticed it in the, in the chat, asked whether uh, we have any idea of how many of the participants in the initial leader course were um, education designers just having a look, um, kicking the tire, so to speak. Um, Sandra, it's a good question. I think uh, a large number, based from the interactions that we were seeing in the discussion forums, a good number of participants were educational designers, uh, as well as library professionals. I mean, it's a course with um, keen interest in you know, information sciences and information studies. So there was a, a large cohort from the, the library professionals. And that kind of is going to tie in with an innovation pilot we're thinking about in the future. But again, Sandra, I think you uh, are alluding to the halo effect that is sitting in that data. Um, for example, in terms of qualifications, uh, there are a large number of participants with postgraduate qualifications that would not necessarily be typical of the OERU audience of the future. So he hence my reservations around, you know, drawing too many inferences from the data at this stage. Yeah, it's not a bad right. thing. They will um, promote it for us, but it's generally the first time we're in the course, it will be easy to think about and library professionals. Absolutely, yes. Um, Wayne and, and Sandra, it might be worth um, just mentioning something which I don't think we've, um, I don't know that we've mentioned it previously, Wayne, but uh, we, we had an interesting, um, announced or, or we got contacted by a fellow in Kerala in uh, Western India who sent us a photograph of a room that he had hired uh, and a, a, a large collection of PCs connected to the internet and I think he had 45 Kerala housewives taking part in a in he, he facilitated essentially them taking the, the leader course and so that was um, a very uh, gratifying thing to see that, that they self-organizing to actually make use of this, of this resource, this educational resource. That's right. mm. So yeah, um, we have pictures of that. It was actually through our, through our Mastodon that he posted, our Mastodon uh, network that he posted the picture. So we'll have to um, include that in some of our materials for the park. Yeah, in, in our marketing or our annual report. I'm sorry, I'm I'm right now, I'm in the conference. <laughs> right. Plus Wayne. <laughs> yeah, Wayne. Sorry about that. I'm juggling um, multiple phone calls. <laughs> um, I was sorry, Dave. Were you able to find uh, um, find the the image on our master yeah. I, I I'll have to look for it, but I will we'll certainly uh, have it. I, I definitely have it. Um, I just need to <laughs> work out where I put it. I, I've just, just yeah. for you. I don't know if you heard me, but I just posted it for you in the chat. Oh, there okay. Who, who was it? So that's Ryan. Ryan. Oh, okay. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. So you can have a look at that. If you, those of you who are looking at the chat, if you if you haven't seen it, the chat will. Um, Contains a link that Ryan posted uh, from our Mastodon, and you can you can view the uh, the photograph, which is pretty cool. <laughs> what I'll do is I might just get it up and screen share it. There we go. There we go. So that was the session that he uh, was running for um, housewives in, in India, our first cohort, which was quite refreshing uh, that he took the trouble to share that with us. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Uh, just a quick comment from, from Jim Taylor. Um, the folder that you see on the screen um, is also useful for what I refer to as internal marketing in terms of you know, spreading the word about the potential of what we're doing here. Um, so that's an, another issue that I think uh, will need to be looked at as we you know, go through the agenda and the meeting in Port Macquarie. Thanks. Thanks for that, Jim. Yeah. Yeah, the comments, other questions? 
I, yeah. Yeah, I must. I must say, I'm. I'm. I'm happy with the uh, progress thus far, um, and um, it, I mean, it's been an incredibly valuable learning experience for us, both in terms of the technology back end, uh, but also in having a better understanding of the independencies of teaching uh, in this environment for formal academic credit. Uh, you know, I've had a long career in higher education, but uh, I have a far greater appreciation and now for the challenges of uh, international micro-credentialing uh, and credit transfer uh, you know, across the regions that we're working in. And we've made good progress on that front. Okay. So at this point, uh, if there are no additional questions, I would like to hand over to my colleague, uh, Dave Lane in Christchurch, uh, who will be able to update us on some of the uh, technology improvements we've been working on. Yes, hello everyone. Um, I uh, wanted to show just one or two little tidbits of the, so because we have a fairly small team, as you're well aware, um, we have to pick very carefully the strategic and, and strategically the things that we choose to invest our, our technology energy in. So I spend a lot of my time um, identifying and um, implementing existing best of breed open source tools. And then I invest a bit of uh, hopefully well-placed time strategically in connecting those things together. So I, I'm the person who does all the gluing and duct taping. <laughs> um, and every now and again, we run into particular um, shortcomings or, or unexpected um, barriers to uh, achieving our, our ultimate goals of, of creating an accessible um, educational experience. Uh, and we end up having to scramble to produce software that um, fills that very uh, specific um, requirement. Now, um, I just yesterday posted a, uh, so I maintain a, a blog about the technology that we use within the, um, the OERU. Uh, I'm just going to share the screen here quickly. You'll be able to find it from about the 50 million windows that I've got open. Here we go. So, for those of you who um, are interested in some of the technologies that we're using, I've been trying hard to uh, periodically write up uh, specific instructions um, or overview documents that, or overview posts, which describe how we do things and and how these um, how these things work and how they can be made to work for our partners as well. Anyone can look at this website and see uh, the the kind of the recipes. So, for example, um, I, I posted a link in the uh, in the chat earlier um, about the Mautic uh, how-to for, for installing that. Um, yesterday I posted the most recent uh, post, the article which is about something which we call our blog feed finder and you may recall that Wayne when he showed you the um, the kind of interactions that we offer uh, that we monitor and that we then that we then make available to our learners on each course. Um, he talked about scanning of blogs. Uh, you might have also recalled that from the wheel that, of technologies that Wayne showed. Um, we have for quite some time offered our learners the opportunity to submit a URL for a blog, an address, web address for a blog, in conjunction with their account if they register for a course on our course website. Um, that has had an unexpected, um, <laughs> unexpected side effect. It turns out, so, so in order for us to mechanistically scan a person's blog, we need to actually get the web address of what's called a feed from their blog. Almost all blog platforms like WordPress or Blogger or Medium or any number of other blog platforms that you're familiar with um, offer something called a feed, and that is a machine-readable representation of the website that can be um, efficiently parsed by another computer to identify content of interest. And it turns out that very few people know what a feed is. And we had um, hundreds of uh, registrants on the course website who filled in a blog URL. And 
maybe one in 20 of those was actually a valid blog URL. All the rest of them were, were <laughs> facebook.com or google.com or the course website's address itself copied and pasted in or various other um, uh, email addresses and just random bits of text that people posted. And we realized very quickly that if we were going to have a, a system which could gather these web addresses and then subsequently scan through them periodically to look for uh, posts of interest that could be then incorporated into that um, interactive feed for each course, we needed to come up with a better solution. So the solution that we came up with is called the Blog Feed Finder. And here, this, this is an article that any of you are welcome to, um, I'll just post, uh, just copy a um, link into the chat if any of you are interested in reading it. It shows a lot more pictures and so on of how it all works. But here is the, here is the uh, actual uh, Blog Feed Finder itself. The idea behind it is that it's an incredibly simple interface. It, all it is is a text field. And the idea here is that someone can, um, can take their, their, the learner in order to find the web address of their feed is invited to uh, go to their blog and copy and paste the blog address from the address bar of their browser into the um, into this form field. Now, just for the sake of, of demonstration, the tech blog has a, um, has a feed, whoops. And if I put that in there and I hit enter, the system actually goes to that website behind the scenes. It actually looks at the content of the page. It looks for references to feeds. Um, it looks in a, a number of well-known places that blog feeds reside, namely the, the, the URL path that is used to, to point to those things. And it attempts to find a blog feed. In this particular case, and, and any of you are welcome to go to, um, I'll post the, 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 the link for it is, is this here. You can try it right now if you feel like it, uh, if you're bored. <laughs> um, on the uh, live site. You'll see it there on the uh, chat now. It's the blog feed finder. And if you are registered for a course um, and you find a, and you find a uh, blog feed, you'll be able to select um, from amongst the courses that you're registered for, which course to associate with that blog feed. So you could, for example, have a different blog for each course that you're uh, taking part in. Um, and and if, you, if you make a post on the, any of, uh, on the relevant blog and you include a tag, which is the course tag for the course that you've associated with, that blog post will be referenced in the feed for that course. So the idea behind this is to create a very straightforward interface that even people who don't know what a URL or what a feed is have the ability to, to identify uh, reliably what, what, what their blog feed URL is and have assistance in actually making it, um, associating it with their uh, registered account. You'll also notice that um, thanks to the influence of Jim Taylor and elaboration theory, we've been very careful to, to not flood the learner with too much information. So for example, um, it, tells you, it tells you here, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but um, that uh, the blog feed finder has found that the web address um, that I initially put into the, the form field um, redirects to another, to another site. If I hover over this I, it gives me additional, more technical information for people who are curious, but we don't wanna bombard people with too much information. It gives them the technical details if they're interested in learning that. And then subsequently, it also tells them that it has found a feed and it tells them what type of feed it is and it tells them the actual address. And so the idea is that you can actually use this as a learning opportunity about these sorts of um, technologies at the same time as you're solving this problem of, of identifying and, and specifying a, a valid feed. So anyway, that is a uh, open source piece of software. Um, some of you may know, uh, um, Alan Levine, who is a um, technologist involved in uh, online education in Canada nowadays, uh, formerly from the US. 
Um, he uh, goes by the moniker Cog Dog in various online forums. And he has done a review of, of this blog, Feed Finder, because he has also had this problem. Uh, he's struck this particular problem in the past as well and had come up with a different solution. But now we're working together to uh, make sure that what we've got here is the, is the best of all worlds. So does anybody have any questions on that? Yeah, no, Chris, I might just, um, speaking to David Porter, my understanding is that um, you integrated the blog feed finder in one of your Ontario Extend courses. So it was, you know, it was just great to see uh, that kind of re reuse going on uh, within the network across our mm. national borders, yeah. Yeah, actually, CogDog has done a, um, a review. I think I've, I've linked to it in the uh, post that I made yesterday on the, uh, the tech um, blog site. But he actually did a review full of screenshots and so on, comparing the blog feed finder that the OERU now has with uh, the solution that he'd previously come up with and, and showing how they, how they differ and, and the pros and cons of each. So yeah, it's quite, quite cool. Um, now, there was the next step. Uh, shall I show quickly the, the, the new um, registration and enrollment functionality? Yes, please, Dave. Um, one of the challenges we've been facing, uh, well, not challenges, but we've noticed that um, for a large number of our learners, uh, they're not quite uh, au fait with how these technologies work from a registration process. Um, and so we've been doing a bit of work in that space. So, Dave, I'm keen for you to show sure. um, what you've been doing there. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just share the screen again. Um, those of you who have gone, and if, if you go to the course website now, this, this uh, screenshot that I'm showing is the current course site. If you go, simply go to course.oeru.org, you'll notice that there is no information. Well, you, you'll see that I'm logged in as an administrator at the top here. But you'll notice that there's, if you're not logged in as an administrator, which is almost everyone besides me and, and Wayne and a couple of other people, um, you'll, you'll see that the only uh, kind of interface uh, for, for regarding um, registration is this uh, little um, icon, this bust icon, which, which shows up. It doesn't actually say very clearly what it is, and, and someone would have to hunt around to work out that that would be where they would log in. If you are logged in, you, you receive this, um, you receive this uh, pop up when you click on it and it allows you to either log out or to update the country that you're that you're registered uh, as your as having sorry as the country with which you most closely identify uh, it doesn't allow you for example to change your password it doesn't allow you to change your given name or various other aspects of your of your um, profile on the website uh, another thing that is um, frustrating about the this system, and this is our historical uh, login system, um, it doesn't tell you whether or not you're enrolled for a given course. You'll see that if I'm in the context of a course, namely in this case, Lita 101, if I click on this icon, it, it just, it, the, the interface doesn't provide any indication whatsoever that you're registered or not for this course. So you could be looking at the course and the original um, thinking behind this uh, login process was, or this registration process was that simply by going to the page and being logged in, you were implicitly registered. And that was, that was due to some vagaries of the way that the WordPress platform works. Um, we've decided that that's actually very unnecessarily uh, convoluted and um, uninformative to users who might have lack of confidence or discomfort with uh, you know dealing with all these new platforms so uh, we also have an indication that some people who signed up for the Lita 101 course um, by virtue of having signed up found it difficult to then register for the 102 and 103 and 104 courses subsequently um, and so we decided to remedy that problem this was another one of our strategic uh, software development exercises so what I've done and I'm showing this to you in a, on a local development version of the site rather than on the live site because it hasn't yet been deployed because it's still a, a, I'm still refining the mobile um, versions of this capability. But I'm just going to switch to another browser window here. And I'll show you what it looks like. So the idea behind this is to um, 
not be coy with the information that we provide and instead, instead to uh, be very explicit about what's happening. So you'll notice now um, that we now have that same bust icon, but now it's up uh, off that off that bar. That bar, the green bar that you can see there is the space for the navigation when you're in the context of a course. Outside of the, co the context of a course, namely on the, on the main page of the site, there is no navigation there. But if you go to this uh, form, which now says login and register, which I think is a lot more clear uh, for a user, if you click on that, you have the option to log in or if you aren't or if you don't already have an account you can register so if you go to register you get a form that looks like this and it's it my form is being filled in by my password manager so so don't uh, worry about that this the form is designed to be very informative so as you start typing things in it will tell you if you're doing something which will result in an invalid um, submission so for example uh, it's telling me it as it, it my password keeper um, has filled in my username of Dave, and it's telling me that that username is already in use um, because it has checked with the actual site to see whether that username is in use. And every username has to be unique within the OERU system, which is explained in the, in the, in the form itself. This also allows me to set a password and an email address for myself and my country of origin, and you can pick the country from a country list. Um, it also has the possible it also accommodates the possibility that someone might click on register and then realize part way through Oh, hang on. I actually already have registered. In fact, the username I put in is already taken and that's by me I've already logged in here Six months ago when I thought about doing this course and I'd forgotten you can then go directly to the login prompt If you want to and so in that case you just get your login and your password and and you can and you can click login. Similarly, if you realize that you're going to log in and you haven't created an account, you can immediately go to register instead. It also gives you the option of a password reset if it turns out that you've forgotten your password. Now, if on the other hand, I'm already logged in, um, let me just show you what you see. Um, I have to switch to another window. Here we go. Okay, so now you can see that I've got my name, my photograph, and my name, uh, which is shown in the top corner. Please let me know if any of you, if I'm barreling ahead and I'm actually not showing you the right screen. If you can't see what I'm talking about, let me know. But I think I'm showing the right screen. So you can now see that I'm logged in, and I'm, but I'm, I'm now on the front page of the course site, so you, there's no course context that I'm in. If, on the other hand, so um, just by the by, when I click on this now, I have the option of editing my profile, updating my password, or logging out. So if I edit my profile, I can, these are the values that are currently there, and I can change them and save them, or I can cancel if I decide that I don't want to make, save those changes. I can also update my password. That requires that I put in I put in my current password to pre prevent people who are, for example, using a shared computer in an internet cafe or at a university or something, accidentally leaving their leaving themselves logged in and allowing someone else to sit down at the computer after them and alter their password without them knowing about it and lo thus locking them out of their account in the future. In this case, you have to know your current password to be able to change to a new password. If you don't know your current password, you send an email. To yourself for a password reset which helps to avoid that um, problem when using uh, public machines. Um, if I go to a uh, sorry if I go to a course context it now shows me that I'm enrolled in the course and it has this little icon with a little dot in the middle of it just to provide a quick graphical um, acknowledgement of that. We have all the same capabilities but we also have the option of leaving a course that we're enrolled for um, or unenrolling. I, I may change that language from leave to unenroll. That's, that's a, a, a detail. So for example, I can go here and say um, I can unenroll from this course uh, and, and it tells me that I can re rejoin it in future. If I unenroll, the system unenrolls me and it reloads the page to reflect uh, that I'm no longer enrolled and it just shows me the new status and it's very clear the idea is that it's very clear as to what's going on um, for, for the user at any given time. So now you can go back and you can enroll. And all I need to do is click enroll. And at that point I'm enrolled. Now in the back 
in behind all of this, when I enroll, it's actually signing me up implicitly for the emails for the course so that I'm, a, I'm made aware of when the course is going to launch, when, when the next assignment is due, and so on. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that's linked to these changes in the state of a, a registered user on the site. So just to give you an idea, that's that, that hopefully um, gives you some insight as to how this is, is all put together. But hopefully this is a big improvement over the existing system for registration and course enrollment and unenrollment. So does anyone have any questions? Uh, not just a, uh, a question as such, but just an observation which may or may not be immediately apparent to everybody, but being open source technology, uh, we have the APIs or the, the, the technical uh, ability for our different platforms to speak to each other. Um, and, and, and so uh, we, we have ways in which the course site uh, actually communicates with the Mortic uh, automated software engine um, so, uh, you know, if a learner were to have signed up on the Mortic engine, we know that association uh, between, you know, somebody having signed up on Mortic and, you know, populating the email campaigns and what it means to be registered or not registered on a course site. So that's, you know, one of the advantages we have with this component-based system is that these APIs uh, can speak uh, to each other. So, Dave, I hope that uh, explanation was not too technical. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, that's fine. Um, hey, I just wanted to mention one quick thing that uh, people may not be aware of. Um, interestingly, uh, you may not realize this, but um, the OER Foundation maintains hosting infrastructure in in the U.S., in Germany, and in Australia. And as it happens, uh, the course website is hosted in Germany. And when it talks to our Mautic, it's talking to Australia because the Mautic system is hosted in Sydney. So just to give you an idea of the kind of transnational uh, infrastructure that we're talking about, <laughs> it's, yeah. Um, yeah, it becomes, distance is no longer uh, relevant as it happens. So um, I'm just uh, checking if there are any questions or comments or from the floor. If not, then we can move on. Right, so we're back to the agenda page. Uh, moving on now to the um, strategic planning consultation. So at the 2017 partners meeting, we had a breakout group uh, that uh, uh, took a closer look at the uh, strategic plan for the next uh, couple of years. Um, and at that meeting, uh, it, it was recommended that the high-level strategic goals that we had in the previous strategic plan were still valid and current for the next iteration of the plan. So that's where the high-level strategic goals for the current plan, and this is now, uh, there's a slight typo here, we're going to be running from uh, 2018 through to 20, uh, 2021 for reasons which will become obvious in, in, in a short while. But if you uh, click through there, you'll see our high level strategic plan and and this david port is something that we've borrowed from your work back in the bc campus days sort of the evergreen planning approach which is uh, considerably more agile and responsive uh to you know to these uh, uh, planning methodologies and approaches and so we have the strategic plan this year or this time round is uh, far more succinct we you know we're really tightening things up uh keeping the uh, objectives tight. It's essentially just a, you know, a two-page document um, and uh, the high-level strategic targets that we are aiming to uh, achieve. This will just give you some uh, idea or sense of the trajectory that we're working with uh, for this first, or, you know, from July through to the end of this year, roughly about 2,500 course registrations as we are getting the launches of the courses sorted. Um, part of uh, th there's good news as well. We've received confirmation from the Hewlett Foundation that they will be continuing our general operating support grant for the next three years. 
Um, so obviously we were holding back on the strategic planning exercise because the strategic plan with general operating support from an external donor compared to a strategic plan without uh, additional funding support uh, are two very different strategic plans. So we thought it prudent just to wait and see the outcome of our external funding and pleased to report that uh, the continue, to continuation grant for the OER Foundation to implement the OERU will be continued for the next three years. So that just gives a high level view of you know where we're aiming um, and these numbers uh, in terms of potential savings in tuition, they're US-based numbers based on average data from the US, but we, you know, are aiming to achieve savings of, you know, just short of 14 million US for learners who participate in the OERU of the next period. So that's a high-level strategic plan with our goals and objectives. What we've also done to support the agile planning approach is we've set up a CAN board, uh, which shows the current state of where things are at uh, in relation to the strategic plan. So how this works is we've got different columns for each year of the strategic plan. You'll see at the top there, 2018, 2019, and 2020. Um, here in the backlog column, these are the uh, initiatives, so to speak, that are ready to be injected into the plan. Uh, so here are all the courses that have been published and being uh, prepared for launch uh, in the first year of study. Here in the 2018 column are the actual projects we've completed. They are indicated by the green cards and the projects that are currently in process are the blue cards. Now the advantage of this, this has public access so anyone in the network, or anyone in the world will be able to, to at any time log in and see where we are at with um, each of these initiatives. Um, so for example, learners can actually start, or not learners, people that are interested in this sort of stuff can you know, click on the cards, drill down and get more detailed information of what is happening here. So we can see, oh, okay, we launched Leader 101, there the date, so there's a bit more information there for anybody who's interested in getting more information. So that's currently where we're at at the moment in terms of the technologies we're using to support the next iteration of the strategic plan. Um, what I do want to highlight is there are, of course, a number of interesting interdependencies with the launch like this. Uh, you can't advertise courses for launch until you ensure that the articulation agreements are in place, right? Uh, or at least you can't advertise that learners are guaranteed formal academic credit until we have all the agreements in place. And it turns out that um, building these articulation agreements is uh, m more complex than I re reasonably anticipated uh, initially. And I do want to acknowledge the sterling support we've had from the registrar at University of Highlands and Islands, uh, Rhiannon Tinsley, uh, Andy Brown, who's Head of Academic Development at UHI, Mark Singer from Thomas Edison State University, uh, colleagues at Thompson Rivers University who have also assisted with the collaborative development of the articulation agreement uh, that we have in place. And I'm pleased to say that the articulation agreement between the assessing institutions, the conferring institution, and the OER Foundation uh, for the certificate of um, certificate of higher education business has been signed off. Um, it's a, a lengthy process, apart from you know, sort of the academic alignment of learning outcomes uh, and the like. Uh, there is also legal input. Uh, obviously, before the vice chancellor signs off on a contract like this, uh, the legal departments need to review, and uh, we now have a working exemplar of uh, this agreement for the Certificate of Higher Education Business. And we are currently in the processes of working through uh, the approvals at Thompson Rivers University. I uh, believe the legal department is now currently uh, going over the contractual agreement uh, for the Certificate of General Studies. So that is progressing well as well. So, I mean, I think this is a significant achievement for the OERU in getting international credit transfer agreements in place based on these OER open courses. 
So that's where we're at in terms of uh, the launch of the courses, and we'll now be pro progressing through um, launching the, these yellow cards. We'll be shifting into the columns for 28 and 2019 as we progress with the launch of the first year of study. Um, with regards to improving the OERU operations, uh, we have completed the uh, development of the OERU uh, learner, uh, learner support site, so that's been done. Uh, we're in the processes of implementing the recommendations for the rationalized working group structures. In, in fact, this meeting is an outflow of some of those recommendations from last year's meeting. Uh, we have an initiative uh, that is working on the development of uh, uh, quality guidelines and Adrian Stagg, who's convening that working group for us, will have a chat about that a little bit later when we talk about the agenda. We are well ahead, uh, well away with the planning of the international 2018 international meetings uh, around the technology infrastructure. We've implemented GDPR compliance. Uh, we have our own hosted instance of MORTIC running now. Um, we have piloted the uh, back-end campaigns in MORTIC that automate the sending of these emails as well as the preference campaigns. Uh, we've implemented the improvements that were recommended at the partners meeting for the landing pages of the courses. We've completed the blog feed finder now, which is a valuable addition to the infrastructure. And we are in the process of finalizing the new uh, course registration improvements that they've just demonstrated. The other uh, bit of welcome news is uh, marketing has been our biggest challenge um, for multiple reasons. Uh, you, you may have noticed that the staff working at the OER Foundation are open source people, and we are not very good at marketing uh, because you know we've never had to market our software, and so we just don't have in-house expertise around marketing. Um, and uh, by the same token, uh, our marketing departments at our partner institutions are overstretched. I mean, they are overloaded in terms of workload. And so it's very hard to get um, professional expertise in digital marketing. We are now in the final stages of uh, uh, securing an offshore grant to assist us with marketing. So where we are at at the moment, we are negotiating a 25,000 US dollar grant that will enable us to implement um, pay-per-click advertising campaigns using Google Ads. Um, those of you that were at the 2017 partners meeting will recall that as a nonprofit, we do qualify for the Google for Nonprofits uh, grant, where Google will give us US dollars 10,000 dollars per month um, in pay-per-click advertising uh, and with this grant we're getting from the offshore donor uh, we are now in a position to be able to appoint uh, an external agency with expertise in this kind of marketing the way that we have set this up, I have established a reference group, which is in effect our marketing and recruitment working group, who will provide oversight to the implementation of this marketing project. We've already had a very successful meeting, and I do want to acknowledge the digital marketing expertise at Thompson Rivers University, as well as the digital marketers at Thomas Edison State University, who have been providing invaluable advice in setting up um, this project. So that's what those backlog cards are about there. Um, the work that we need to do in terms of our partner recruitment that's on uh, will be ongoing. But th this grant will enable us to significantly improve our search engine optimization. We are looking at uh, implementing a citizenship pilot where uh, corporates might be able to sponsor specific OERU courses to assist with you know, additional funding to help with our marketing. Uh, we will be implementing a pay-per-click campaign with the help of an external agency. And we are wanting to run a marketing pilot in one of the sub-Saharan African countries 
because we don't know really which marketing strategies are likely to be effective in these in different environments. And so we're going to be working with uh, colleagues we have in, in, in Kenya uh, to pilot you know, marketing strategies that might be more appropriate for the context and the learner audiences we're hoping to serve there. So that's on the marketing front. And finally, I just want to highlight that within the strategic plan, each year we're wanting to implement or integrate one or two innovation pilots uh, where we can go and have a look at you know, smart ideas and test them to see if they're worth implementing. And so one of the innovation pilots we have on the table for discussion at the moment is this concept of community learning hubs, where we work with university libraries and community libraries who might be interested in providing face-to-face -face support for one or two face-to-face -face sessions for the learning in a digital age course. So Sandra, that links up with uh, the point that you made earlier of the interest that library professionals have in the information literacy side of things. And this might be a, a, an interesting way to A, widen the quality of support that learners would receive through the learning in the digital age courses. But more importantly, because this is OER, learning in the digital age could be implemented for formal academic credit at our local partner institutions for those institutions that are interested in integrating those programs locally, uh, either as electives or uh, within the existing curriculum. So that's one of the pilots we're keen to uh, have a look at. We will do some more detailed planning at the partners meeting hoping to launch this early in the new year. The other innovation pilot we're looking at exploring is I, we've been fortunate to receive a waiver of the setup costs for establishing um, online proctoring with ProctorU. Uh, they have given the OER Foundation a donation to go through the process of actually setting up online proctoring to see what is involved. And so we're wanting to run an innovation pilot for all our partners who are either already using online proctoring or are thinking about implementing online proctoring is to walk through this process with us in establishing online proctoring. So as a benefit to our members, but also a learning process for ourselves, that's the other innovation pilot we're thinking about in 2019. So let me leave that there. Um, that's the high level strategic uh, plan uh, that's on the table. Uh, any thoughts, comments or feedback on the strategic plan as it stands at the moment? I'm just reading the chat. I'm, I'm reading that uh, CSU has been pi piloting, so that's great. Uh, we would really value expertise from colleagues in the network that have been doing this. Um, CSU, I know Athabasca University have implemented ProctorU as well as Thomas Edison State University. I believe there have been discussions at uh, Thompson Rivers University. Uh, Christina, if you're still with us, I'm, I'm not sure where you're at with uh, ProctorU at this, at this stage. I'm not sure if Christine is still with us, but if she is, she, she can pop in or anyone from TLU uh, could possibly update us on the work that's happening around online proctoring there. Hi, it's, I'm sorry, I couldn't find my, take my uh, microphone off mute button. Um, yeah, it's uh, voluntary for OL, uh, Open Learning faculty members to use ProctorU. We have some folk who are really keen on it. Um, and it's also voluntary for students. So that's what we're piloting right now, voluntary for faculty and students can either opt in or opt out and we're gonna evaluate in another six months. Okay, it, it, it sounds exciting. And um, I mean, any pointers you can give us as we move forward on that journey would be well received. I mean, part of what I'm thinking of doing is using the uh, leader 103 uh, micro course, which actually has an objective item assessment. And, and, you know, if the partners within the network are interested in this, to actually sort of take the exam in a proctored environment, so sort of get the user experience, if you see what I'm saying. Um, and uh, it would be an interesting way of, of, of testing this, because I think 
there are interesting opportunities for OERU and our micro credentialing um, initiatives and how they might tie up with academic credit. Yep. Just a quick comment again, uh, Wayne. I think the, the other proposed pilot on community learning hubs um, also has the potential to test one of the original concepts of the model, which was Academic Volunteers International, uh, yeah. where I think we will get support in communities if we are able to, to launch an effective pilot here. And the other flow on benefit from this is to spread the word about the opportunities that are available. So it, it cuts across into marketing also. So I think I'm hopeful that we can get both these pilots off the ground um, as proposed. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that, Jim. I mean, I think these are going to be uh, particularly valuable for us. And of course, we will also be open to, to other pilots that might emerge in discussions at, at the partners meeting and, you know, slotting them into, you know, the, 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 the uh, planning cycle. Um, so, yeah, we'll be pr proceeding with planning there. Uh, except, uh, Brian, you've asked a question in relation to P P I A. Oh, okay. So that's an internal conversation. Okay. Any other questions from the floor? Any, um, major shortcomings in the strategic plan as you've seen it thus far? Um, what I will be doing is I will be sending out an invitation again for, uh, inviting additional feedback and comments uh, you know, for people who haven't been able to attend this meeting or if you want to you know add any uh, additional thoughts uh, to how the strategic plan is unfolding you'll be most welcome to do so and you'll have the opportunity to do that but at, at this stage um, I will take silence to mean assent that we are more or less on the right track and given that we have an evergreen uh, strategic planning model we can tweak adapt and refine as more information comes to hand. So I'm hearing silence, I'm hearing silence. So that sounds uh, okay. Great, and so, so, so now the, the final item on the agenda is uh, due to our open uh, practices and open policies. We always consult on the assembly of the OERU partners meeting. Uh, for those of you who haven't attended a partners meeting before, uh, uh, the partners meeting is essentially a planning sprint uh, where we develop proposals for action for various components of the implementation of our strategic plan, initial first drafts, which we then use to refine and tweak as we, uh, as we are moving forward. And we've had a couple of years, um, you know, refining and tweaking the model. Uh, this is now our seventh international partners meeting and we, we have a high level structure that uh, seems to work well for, for the meetings and uh, well if it, if, you know, if it ain't broke don't fix it so in terms of the high level structure and the methodologies we uh, recommend keeping it the same um, but then having a look at how uh, what we're aiming to populate in the individual sessions um, obviously we you know we, we start with our principles of engagement and the aims of the meeting, uh, bring uh, new members who are new to the OVRU just up to speed in terms of uh, what has happened with the OVRU, our major milestones. And then we move into this review, reflection and setting priorities where we have a look at what has been done. We'll go into a little bit more detail of what we've achieved and uh, sh show some of the inner workings of um, our technology and our courses and what we've learned. And then we have this critical friend review uh, process where we take a close look at things that have worked well and, and things where we need to improve uh, in, the, in setting the meeting priorities. Um, the first day of the meeting focuses on the, you know, the past and present. Um, and another point I should highlight is we use these breakout sessions with well, people kind of uh, vote with their feet in terms of their own interests and their own expertise in terms of which working groups uh, they want to contribute to. So um, just if that's not clear, uh, 
you know, the meeting decides which uh, working groups will be, uh, you know, which we will focus on if we need to add a new working group based on what the conversation that's taking place. But where we're at at the moment, uh, I think the priorities are we need to have a think about our digital marketing, uh, do a little bit more planning around the process that is involved with this digital marketing project. Because by the time of the partners meeting, we'll have a lot more information around the funding and the appointment of the the agency, and you know how we can integ uh, integrate partner in, uh, input into that process. Uh, we always have a, a close look at our technology suite. Um, you know what are the priorities for the next year? Um, we are planning on spending a bit more work on the OERU quality initiative, which has been led by the uh, uh, curriculum and quality working group and the thinking here is that we would have um, possibly two or three ongoing sessions uh, to do some focus planning around our quality work and I'd like to invite Adrian Stagg from the University of St Southern Queensland uh, to maybe just talk to this point uh, because uh, Adrian you're convening this work for us uh, I think it would be valuable for colleagues just to get uh, a bit of a sense of what this is all about. Uh, thanks very much, Wayne. Uh, so basically, this came out of some discussions oh, probably about a year or so ago, actually at the last partners meeting, where there was um, very strong discussion around how we um, how we capture best practice across the network and also how we manage to ensure that there is good practice throughout the courses that are being offered through the OERU. This manifested in a uh, project team that was pulled together and that's had a, a number of different members who have been very generous with their time and input uh, so that we could take a look at a range of uh, very similar products that were around similar tools and then create one that actually reflected the nuances of the OERU experience. Now at this point we have got a draft version that will be made available very soon and we're using that to uh, currently undertake a, a pilot review of a couple of the current OERU courses. During the meeting, what is being suggested is that we have a couple of uh, sessions, uh, well actually three sessions, whereby anyone who is interested in supporting or assisting this effort uh, comes along and we work on the draft versions of the reviews, uh, put them to a bit of a consensus, a little bit of reality testing as well, and really leverage the experience that is in the room. What I would like to have then is a uh, as close to a, uh, a, a strong working draft for implementation at the end of the two days uh, that we could actually present overall to the partners network and seek some level of endorsement for. Now obviously one of the strengths of this type of work is that we're going to have people from a range of perspectives who are able to bring their own experiences to the table, but also given the open nature of all of the work of the OERU, it does mean that if you see value in this kind of a review tool for online learning for your institution, you'd be able to take it because it's openly licensed, remix, repurpose, reuse, and actually implement it at your own institution if that is what you would like to do. So what I'm putting forward is a proposal that we have a few breakout sessions, three, uh, where anyone who is interested would come along and help to work on those drafts. So does that cover everything that you were hoping for, Wayne? Oh, absolutely, Adrian, and thank you very much. I mean, this is a, a, a an approach we experimented with at the 2017 meeting where we had the marketing group uh, focus on three sessions in progression, and there was, you know, we were able to make significant progress in getting, you know, sort of a, a quality draft on the table and moving forward. So, I mean, I, I think it would uh, work well as well for the quality initiative um, because, you know, there's a lot of discussion that needs to be, you know, taken place around these things and having a bit of quality time to do that face to face is, is going to help, I think, yes. So that's around the, the quality initiative. I, we'll have a bit of a discussion around, 
you know, how we can improve in, in institutional engagement uh, with OERU. I mean, there are clearly a number of uh, advantages uh, to the, the partnership and the network and, you know, to have a bit of a think about, you know, how, how we can improve the return on investment and value of membership uh, within the network. Uh, this is a little bit more procedural, but it relates to the decision around the restructuring of the working groups. We need to have a conversation around the conveners for each of those groups and how, how they'll be constituted. And I think uh, day one is a good spot to be doing that. So that's the high level uh, for day one. I'll just quickly run through day two and then I'll open up the floor for discussion to see if we have uh, any additional items we want to add there. Uh, the first session in the morning when we are still fresh um, uh, on arrival, we can start working and having a think through the innovation pilots, uh, you know, just doing a bit of planning around those innovation pilots we've got on the table, seeing if there are any other innovation uh, pilots we want to add. Um, we want to have a focus session on well, what are the things that we uh, that will increase the return on uh, return on investment of membership in the OVRU. So we have a whole suite of, of of things and courses and procedures and technologies that potentially could have um, impact on our campuses in, in improving efficiencies. And it's just to have a think about well, what are the things we can be doing to increase the return on investment of our partners in, in OERU. Uh, the second session of the quality breakout session there, uh, we, uh, this was a great idea that was put forward by our hosts. Uh, Val, th thanks again for that. And Adrian, your work in helping us put this together. We are planning to run an open webinar uh, inviting you know, folk from around the world and particularly this region to come into the meeting, uh, we have a number of guest speakers or panelists that will be joining us. Um, so here's the landing page, folk can register. I want to say thank you to you know, the folk who will be uh, joining us on the panel and your willingness to share your experience and expertise. And also just a, a shout out there, um, if uh, you do know folk that are interested locally within your own networks who might want to pop in and join us for this open webinar, uh, please share the link um, you know, to, to register and get involved. We've got an associated little email campaign on the back end which helps people get started and you know, how they can engage and we'll send out reminders uh, for that webinar. Um, and then the, the, uh, the session here is a bit more around the strategic planning having a focus on calibrating the KPIs for 2019. Uh, we think it's important given recent developments to uh, review our open business model. You know, is it still up to date? Are the aspects that we need to be adding that uh, are, you know, in, in, you know, improve the return? I mean, I think one of the examples is uh, that is not adequately reflected in the, 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 the open business plan. Uh, at the moment is reusing open source solutions within our own institutions. Uh, I don't think that is incorporated well enough into our plan. Uh, reviewing our recruitment letters that go out to partners. Um, a little bit of work around the planning for the process evaluation, which is the next step in the evaluation process. We always have this, this uh, session where the chief executives at the meeting uh, shape the agenda for the CEO's meeting on the following day. So the CEs that are present and the folk that will be attending the CEs meeting will be present there and help shape the agenda for Friday's meeting. And uh, if needed, a third session on the, the, the quality working group, depending on you know, how, how much progress we've made at, at the meeting. That's pretty much the shape of the agenda as it stands at the moment and I would like to invite your feedback, thoughts and comments um, and if this is more or less the right uh, shape for the agenda uh, after my consultation with the African and European group this evening uh, we can all then move forward with uh, populating the website with the agenda. So let me open up the floor there. Any comments? Hi, Wayne. Yes, it's, it's uh, Christine. Val here. I'm just wondering, oh. um, in the year in review, 
and maybe you're going to include this. I was thinking it might be helpful for people to see some of the statistics on the, you know, the demographics of the people who have enrolled already and their motivation for enrolling yep. around professional development versus yep. certification, et cetera. Yep. I was just thinking that might be some interesting details to include. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, Val. Ex excellent suggestion. I'll make sure that we include um, access to the statistics for input into the meeting. So I've, I've made a special note of that here. Thanks for that, Val. Alan, there's been some interesting chat and some ideas put up there. So you can have a look at that later and, and see whether or not there are things that can be folded into the agenda. So okay, course, thanks for that, Alan. I, to be honest, I haven't been following the chat that closely, well, but I'll no, make. Yeah, you shouldn't be, but so that's no problem. <laughs> but you will see ideas there. It's a, it's a matter of kind of slotting them into the right uh, uh, to the right spot in the agenda. Yeah. yeah, you have a very full agenda anyway. I think it would cover all contingencies. Yep, yeah. but I'll, I'll take a close look at that, Alan. Thanks for those who have commented and made suggestions in the chat. Um, we will work those into the agenda as well. Thanks for that. So I'll take it if uh, I'm not uh, hearing anything that other than the contributions by a chat, we are more or less comfortable with the shape of things as they're standing at the moment. Um, and, you know, take silence to mean assent for moving forward with the next steps. Yeah, it looks like a great agenda, Wayne. It's going to be uh, a full three days by the time we finished. Yep, when we, we get folk that are volunteering time, we've got to work them hard, eh? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there. And then just open up the floor to any general matters. Uh, are there any thoughts, official comments that we haven't covered in today's agenda? Um, please feel free to, to add them now. Um, otherwise, we can adjourn the meeting. Just reading the chat comments, so yep, all good. Just a brief uh, final comment, Wayne. Uh, I think it's really reassuring that the goals that were established um, in the early days of been maintained as a focus throughout the whole project, which has been running for some time now. And we have evolved the focus somewhat, but I think the original goals of the project uh, stand up should uh, give us confidence that we're you know, moving in the right direction still, I hope, thanks. Yeah, thanks for that, Jim. Um, we, we're very fortunate we have a, a large team of very experienced folk from around the world, including yourself, who donate hours in providing advice, direction, and feedback. Uh, we're very fortunate, um, but you know, it, uh, I think it's just kind of, you know, it's adding tremendous value to what we uh, set out to achieve. OERU was always a, a bold project, and um, we, we, we're now seeing it you know, being implemented you know, on the ground. Uh, Rajiv, I'm not sure if you do have access to a microphone. You asked uh, around uh, open boundary courses. I think it's a, a particularly important question. And if you are still with us, if you could just um, pop in and just elucidate a little bit about what you mean by open boundary, and then um, I can respond. Sure. Thanks, uh, Wayne. Um, well, I was thinking really about uh, the structure, about four offerings of micro courses per year, uh, especially with the cohort variety. Uh, and the opportunity where we've got similar courses taught face-to-face -face at our institutions to offer it as an open boundary course, where, for example, students, uh, tuition-paying students at Kwantlen Polytechnic University would be interacting, in particular with the peer, uh, peer activities with OERU students uh, as a way of, of really serving both. Yep. I, I, Rajiv, I think it's an excellent suggestion and an exciting opportunity. Um, this ability to have multiple instances of the same course running simultaneously for learning groups, they could be students paying full, uh, full tuition, getting full service support at the institution, interacting with OERU learners. But what it also could be, and this is I think the advantage of our distributed component-based platform, it can also be multiple instances of different 
of OERU courses on different sites, if you see what I mean. They, there could be an instance of a OERU course sitting at Sailor Foundation, for example. And in fact, we have, have an example with Sailor replicated learning in the digital age on their platforms. We could have different institutions, or all, all the institutions that are participating in learning in a digital age, for example, could have their own instances of learning in a digital age. And with the technology suite we've got on the back end, we can have these learner groups interacting with each other in very, very interesting ways, which um, you know, just gives us very interesting opportunity. Uh, Rajiv, I'm not sure if there's a word for this. It's kind of sort of the, the, the technology alternative to the open pedagogy stuff. You know, it's the things that we are able to do with open that we aren't able to do with closed environments, and particularly the open boundary courses is one of those examples. So um, I, mean, I would love to see that happen. Maybe that's one of the innovation pilots that uh, we need to be having a conversation uh, about at the meeting, yeah. Yeah, I would think so. And, and I think it's in some sense related to a discussion that was happening in the chat about exploring the potential of open pedagogy, uh, even in terms of the sustainability of some of our, our course development, uh, thinking about small content updates uh, through the courses, uh, sort of a feedback loop which students will go through. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, excellent suggestion. I mean, I think we had um, at the 2017 meeting, one of the suggestions was, was that was put forward was um, for, for example, uh, education students or postgrad education students that are learning about design and, open, and you know, sort of open design, having projects converting sailor courses for the OERU platform, for example which would be an example of how one could implement that kind of open pedagogy in a very meaningful way, uh, because I mean, the OBRU is a real thing, and you know, we can help learners uh, uh, you know, get access to a more affordable education, and that might be an interesting project to think about. We, in fact, have a course, uh, Digital Skills for Collaborative OER Development, which is actually a course teaching people how to develop uh, courses for the OBRU platform. So there may be, partners in the network who through their uh, postgrad, you know, teaching certificate programs might want to integrate an open module where we do some of that work. So yeah, the, the open pedagogy stuff is quite exciting. Great. Well, if there are no further questions from the floor, I uh, suggest that we adjourn. Uh, I am around here, so um, if you know anybody wants to stay on for a conversation, that's fine. But please feel free to to leave. I will note the meeting formally adjourned at twelve thirty eight uh, NZ uh, day uh, daytime, and I'm pleased that we will manage to finish up before the two hours were done. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time, uh, contributions, and inputs. Much appreciated. We will work through the chat conversations and make sure we have those bases covered. I've been a good lad and remembered to save the chat because that would be a challenge if I stopped the meeting and haven't saved chat. Great, thanks everyone. I'm going to uh, shut down the meeting and I'll share the recording shortly. Thanks, Jim. See you later. Bye-bye. Thanks, Una. Bye-bye.